So I want to thank you for spending some time with me to talk about rotator cuff tears, okay? Um, and again, one of the most interesting questions I get from patients is, what is a rotator cuff? Oftentimes, actually, they tell me it's a rotator cup, like you drink out of, and it's actually a cuff, like your sleeve. Why is it called that? Well, the shoulder has four primary muscles that move or rotate the arm. One of them sits on top of the shoulder here and raises your hand up. The other muscle comes across the front of your shoulder here and brings the arm in. The other two go across the back and bring the arm out. So top muscle raises your arm, front muscle brings it forward, and the two muscles bring it out. As you can see, the rotator cuff muscles rotate the arm in space. And like this shirt forms a cuff around my wrist, these four muscles, top, front, and back, form a kind of cuff around the top of the arm bone. So together, they rotate the arm and they form a cuff. We call them the rotator cuff. Now, what's interesting about rotator cuff tears is they're as different as you and me. They, are, they come in all sorts of sizes, all sorts of literally shapes, and have, in my opinion, different treatments based on the kind of rotator cuff. A lot of people, a lot of people will tell me, oh, Jim down the street or Nancy down the street had a rotator cuff repair, and they did such and such, or they did, didn't do such and such. And I always find it interesting because from my standpoint, having fixed thousands of rotator cuff tears at this point, I would tell you it's a very blanket statement that really doesn't communicate the actual problem that that person may or may not be having. So uh, I would tell you the first thing to understand is what is it, which is what I shared with you. The second thing to understand is that they're very different and some tears are more serious than others. The next thing, question I, I get and see a lot of is what does it look like? I mean, what does it mean to have a rotator cuff tear? And I'll tell you, most people who come to my office with a rotator cuff tear complain of one of two problems, or both. First is, the universal symptom of a rotator cuff tear is not pain while using your arm. In fact, most people don't have pain while using their arm. What they complain about is pain at night. And it's a peculiar kind of pain at night. There are actually, in my experience, two kinds of night pain that occur with the shoulder. One of them is like the rotator cuff, where the person will tell me that they dread going to sleep at night. And the reason they dread going to sleep at night is when they lie down, they now have to have the task of finding the position that the arm needs to be in in order to fall asleep. It's a very peculiar thing. And when they find it, typically elevating the arm, they, have to, they fall asleep. And if they move, it wakes them right up. And they have to go again through this whole thing of trying to find somewhere to sleep. It's very different than the other kind of pain that I see most often with biceps injuries, which I'll talk about later, where the person falls asleep easily, but then wakes up constantly with any movement. When they turn from side to side, they get a sharp pain. It wakes them up. So the rotator cuff prevents you from falling asleep because it aches. A biceps pain will wake you up in the midst of sleep. You'll, you can fall asleep, but you wake you up in the middle. And, and so that's the first thing. The second thing that people complain about with rotator cuff tears is weakness. So the, if the muscles that, as I explained to you, rotate your arm in space are torn, yes, you cannot have the strength either to raise your arm, particularly above the shoulder level. So they, they'll also complain of weakness. So those are the two things I see most common in rotator cuff tears. And the point of sharing that with you is to make the point that it, it's not a pain during movement. That's not how you'll tell you a rotator cuff tear. Now, when somebody has a rotator cuff tear, what's important for me to know are three things. First and foremost, their age. It's very important to know the age of a patient with a rotator cuff tear because it really sets the course, in my mind, on how I treat them. I'll tell you why in a second. Secondly, the size of the tear. Which muscles, I told you there are four, which of the four are torn? 90% of rotator cuff tears involve a tear of the top muscle, the very top one. And that's the one that raises your arm, you might recall. Uh, and so it's important for me to know, is, is it just the top one? If so, how big is it? And then the third thing, so age, size of tear, and the third thing is the quality of the muscle itself. 
meaning some muscles when they tear are of good quality and others as they go chronic in nature especially become degenerated the old expression if you don't use it you lose it well the same thing if a muscle tear lingers for a long time that muscle can't be used because it's not attached anymore and it can't work it can't fire and and contract and as, as it, that happens and it goes on for, for a long time, it atrophies. And as it atrophies, it becomes less uh, uh, of a good quality muscle to repair. You might imagine too, and you'd be correct if you did, that as a muscle gets more and more atrophied, it actually undergoes an irreversible change in the muscle so that even if you were to repair it, it wouldn't be worth very much as a muscle. It wouldn't function well. Those are people who I, I see from time to time, unfortunately, who've had a rotator cuff repair of a tendon that should have, or a muscle that should have never been repaired because it wasn't useful anymore, went through all the rehab and so on. We all have heard people who've gone through this before and have done terribly. And they say, well, I still, that so-and-so had a rotator cuff repair a year ago and they still can't raise their arm. Well, maybe the muscle wasn't any good, you know, when they got it repaired. So those are, that's why it's important to understand, just as if you were going to build a house, you want to know what the quality of the material you're using is that you're building the house with. And that's the same with me. When I build, reconstruct the shoulder, a rotator cuff, I want to know what is it I'm uh, dealing with. Let's get back to this point of age, though. Since it can be offensive if I say that, I don't want you to think I'm saying if you're old, I don't worry about you. It, what, I'm, what I am saying, though, is as you get north of 65, the data in the literature, people who study like myself and others in the, in the world, who have studied how do people do when we do treat their rotator cuff tears surgically? Um, well, the answer is they don't do well or they do less. The risk for doing poorly grows as you get over 65. And the reason for that is typically people who are older have bigger tears. And that's, that's the key thing to understand. Um, but uh, uh, you notice I jump into the repair of the rotator cuff uh, when I describe and discuss rotator cuffs because... Um, of all the disorders I treat in the shoulder, and this is an interesting point I think you'll find, of all, the, of all the disorders I treat in the shoulder, the one disorder that I feel is most commonly a problem if neglected is the rotator cuff. Most of the other disorders I take care of, neglect or time as an element really isn't a big deal. You, you can let it go for a while as long as you can tolerate it, that type of approach. There are really two disorders that I, occur, that I see in the shoulder with any uh, frequency where leaving it alone or letting it go becomes an issue. One of the disorders is uh, the rotator cuff tears. If you let those go, they can become a problem. The neglect of that problem can become a problem in, in that you can't fix it anymore. The second issue is instability, and we won't talk about that, meaning dislocations. But, but that's really one of the reasons why I jump right into it. If somebody's less than 60 and they have a rotator cuff tear that is symptomatic, which is why they'd be in my office, it's an important thing for me to acknowledge up front that, that treating it with neglect or, or conservatively is probably not a good idea for them in the long term. Okay. Other than that, when somebody's older, it does also change my, my tactic, if you will, because I, I then tend to, to say that leaving it alone and letting it go if the function is, of the patient is, is satisfactory, you can treat it with cortisone injections and physical therapy. And if it, they can achieve a successful amount, a reasonable amount of uh, pain relief at night and, fun and retain a, enough function, it's fine to let them go. Why do I say that? Because at, at the end of the day, when you're older, the, the treatments of, of, of rotator cuff tears are as follows. Replacement of the shoulder, far better than a rotator cuff repair. Rotator cuff repairs are arduous. They take a long time to recover from. Even though it's outpatient surgery, it takes about a year to get over a rotator cuff repair. In an older patient, not a good idea. A replacement is a very quick operation in my hands. Recovery is very quick, too. You can use your arm right, out, right after surgery, uh, which is very different than having a rotator cuff repair. And if you've known anybody who's had one, you'll know that they're in a sling for weeks and so on and so forth. It's not tolerated well by my older patients. Uh, I would say that that's, that's, that's a young man's game, if you will, um, or young woman's game. Uh, but in, in general, the things to understand about rotator cuff repair, since it's such a broad topic, 
um, is that their age matters, the kind of tear matters, and the, the delay in treatment can be a cons of consequence. Um, that's, I'd welcome, if you have any questions, to come and see me. I'd be happy to go over each of these details with you individually. Thank you. Thank you.